his family is. He's got three kids. Simeon's almost 15. Has he turned 15 yet? Oh, okay, in May. He kept saying almost, almost, almost. <laughs> and then uh, Noel is 13 or 12? 13, okay. And, and Phoebe is 8. And they just go around. They just do this all the time. You know, it's so cool when they come because it's like, I just want to stand back and watch them do it. You know, I don't even want to do it because it's just so neat. Of course, his wife does it too. So I don't want to leave her out, Tina. But um, it's just so neat to see his family all walking in it. You know, that they can do it. The kids can do it. So if they can do it, every one of you can do it. You know, God's no respect of person. And don't think there's anything. It doesn't matter if you're shy. It doesn't matter. Just let God use you. Just step into what God has for you. And, and teach your kids or your grandkids. It's so amazing to see them doing this stuff. And so we're just, I, it's too bad they didn't get to come this weekend. We would have had fun too. But um, I just wanted to tell you, it's just so neat. What, what God is doing through his family. And I just want you to know that it's there for, for everybody. And the little kids in the nursery, she said, I was talking to her, and those are your kids, aren't they? Yeah. And she said, the one that's praying for kids or, or praying for other people already, that is so cool. So, and if you've got kids or grandkids and they're not good with the Holy Spirit, bring them in. I love to pray for people for that. Or if you adults don't have it. You know, it's the power behind praying for people. So, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I tell you, it's really fun to be a dad, to have kids that that know what God can do and what God can do through them. So I'm not living a life hoping that my kids keep off drugs. I'm living a life really excited because my kids are like, Dad, can we go out and pray for the sick today with you? <laughs> you know, they're like, Dad, can I come? Dad, can I come? So I, my, I try to, I have to manage things on the other side of saying, well, you can't really come to this situation because I don't think that this person in the hospital bed is going to want an entire family to send in the room. Uh, those kind of things. So, uh, or no, I'm going to be out past your bedtime tonight. But it's really cool, you know, to have have uh, have kids that are hearing from God, that are that are uh, excited about what they read in the scriptures, because the God they read about in the scriptures is the God that they're seeing in our living room, and the God that they're seeing when we go out uh, shopping. It's the God that they see working through them and around them all the time. And so this book. No one is ever going to be able to talk them out of the God of this book because they're living with the God of this book. Because the God of this book is the living God. So that it's a whole new way of parenting. It's just believe the gospel <laughs> and let God be God. And God, who is God, is exciting. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about being a dad. It's a blessing to be a dad who has who has kids that are being touched and being used uh, in the scriptures, or being used to, to heal the sick and, and to preach the gospel. So I want to uh, go back a little bit into uh, John G. Lake's life after he uh, returned from South Africa. He went to Spokane, Washington, and ministered there for five years. In five years, they shut down a hospital in Spokane. That's how effective their ministry was. They uh, they had over a hundred thousand confirmed healings in five years. So that averaged twenty thousand healings per per year. Uh, in order to do this, one of the things that separated John G. Lake from his contemporary, Smith Wigglesworth, is probably more well known uh, than John G. Lake uh, in a lot of circles. Uh, but he was a, they were contemporaries. But the difference between John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth is this, is that John G. Lake was able to teach the principles by which he himself was operating by and, and raise up other people that were moving in the same level of power and results as him to demonstrate that it had nothing to do with a special gift. Right. To, it had nothing to do with a special anointing. Right. 
It had to do with how Jesus Christ works and the power of God and the, the authority of the kingdom works. And when you're operating uh, in, the, in, in faith, uh, in underneath the authority of God's word, that this is just how things are. So it's really exciting to see that that's what was taking place. Well, some people were a little skeptical and said, you know, John, the reason, at first it was like, you can't get those results here. You got them in Africa because that's where God's doing uh, special miracles over there. Have you ever heard that? But in America, it doesn't work. And sure enough, in Spokane, they got that kind of results right there in the good old U.S. of A. Shut down a hospital in five years. Then people said, oh, you know what? There's a special portal right here. There's just an open heavens right here in Spokane. And, but you couldn't do it somewhere else where there's not this open heavens, where the intercessors have just opened something up. And he said, well, where's a dark place that, that there is no open heavens, that it just wouldn't work? And, and they told him uh, in Oregon, I think it was Portland, Oregon, if I'm not mistaken. And he went to... Uh, Portland opened uh, a ministry up there in five years did the same thing with the same amount of results okay and then he, he carried on and in, in, uh, in, in through the rest of his life uh, he ministered in Houston Texas I believe and there was another another place so the interesting thing that that happened though before uh, before he died, he was very concerned with the future of the ministry because he knew that like Joshua and Caleb, he had gone into the promised land and he was bringing back some big grapes. And he had some things resting on his shoulders and he was, he was asking the Lord, what, what's to become of this ministry and the ground that we have gained for the church? And God gave him a very detailed prophecy about the future of his ministry uh, that is in your book. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it because it's a, it's a detailed prophecy and it has some things to do with some timing uh, about how long it would be uh, go kind of into a dormancy period and the, that God would raise up another man and he would be born in the year that the country stopped growing uh, and that... You know, what happened, and he uses these words like five scores and all those kind of things. I'm still trying to figure out what a score is, so, so I don't mess up the, the, uh, the testimony on, on tape and, and everything like that. The, the timing of the prophecy matches uh, Curry Blake's uh, life history uh, verbatim. Uh, it, it, it's amazing the detail of the prophecy and what happened. So the neat thing that you just need to understand is that God himself prophetically put markers in place that, that pointed out who, who was going to carry this ministry forward. There's a stamp of not only the authority of God's word, the results that you see, but also the pr um, prophetic utterance uh, of who was to take this ministry to uh, carry it on forward and to take it to the, to the next level. Um, Curry has done a better job than I have of telling his own story. Uh, it's right here in the, in the book. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that because those things are very personal, they're very detailed. Uh, but the neat thing about Curry that I really respect, I went down to the... Uh, to the annual conference last year. And I went there partially because in my own journey, I had come from a place, unlike Dave, of having experienced uh, God in a lot of miraculous ways and having uh, very little theology and it was working well. I had a lot of theology and it, won't, and it wasn't working. <laughs> so I, had, I came to know Christ um, when I was in college and very early on, I remember doing Bible studies and thinking, you know, how can we get to obey all the heart commands that are no fun, like turn the other cheek and, you know, forgive your brother 70 times 7 and all that kind of stuff. But we don't get to obey the really fun ones, like cast out demons and heal the sick and raise the dead, you know. And I was looking around for somebody to give me an answer. And, you know, 
we were just dumb college students. Nobody could figure out why we can't, couldn't do that. But we looked around for examples. Where are the people that are walking in this who are, who are telling us that this is for you too? This is not something that was just in the book. Well, we kind of asked the question for just long enough, and then we started getting people who were telling us about things that we needed to do to develop our character. And boy, there's just a lot of stuff that we needed to do. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of carry on living like that. And you're doing your best. But I'll, my wife and I, we came, became missionaries to Turkey. Uh, and it's interesting how often the spiritual battle turns physical. And after two years, we had to come home off the mission field because my wife had uh, illness that we weren't able to get resolved um, at that time in our, in our spiritual growth. But I remember even while we were there, it's like, you know what, they've already got theology. I thought, you know, everybody's going to be real excited because, you know what, what I believe makes more sense than what you believe. How many people do you know get converted because, you know, it's really important for them that everything that in their life just makes perfect sense? We live just kind of like, you know, yours makes sense, but mine makes sense to me. And plus, all my friends, all my relatives, we all believe this and we've always been here. And so, you know, they just couldn't see any difference between the powerlessness that their religion gave them and the powerlessness that I had to offer them. And I, I just remember crying out and saying, Lord, you're able to do so much more for these people. You're able to save them. I know that you're a savior. I know, and it's just so frustrating. And I just remember in my heart saying, you know, I've been prideful in the body of Christ because there are people whose theology doesn't match mine but they get they get a lot better results and so I just said even if I need to not uh, even if I need to hang around people that I don't necessarily agree with all their theology I, I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to be around people that are actually moving in the power of the Holy Spirit well that took me to another level that there was just an openness to say you know what I'm going to learn but what was funny is even then, I was theologically charismatic. I mean, how many people do you know that are just totally convinced? You know what? The power of the Holy Spirit is for today. So I, was, I ended up going up in, to Madison, Wisconsin after we came home from Turkey. Uh, we were able to, 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 by God's grace and through medical doctors at the time, uh, to get my wife's uh, illness taken care of. We went up to Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and there, you know, I remember even while I was while, while I was a pastor, I wasn't yet uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I believed it was for today. <laughs> and I remember uh, a lady in our congregation, uh, she had uh, started dealing with depression. And it came to me in my time of talking to her, I said, have you been praying in tongues much lately? And she said, no, I haven't. And her problem was she had gone through a real difficult time. Uh, and she, every time she started praying, she started worrying. The mind just got, the mind and the emotions just got away. And for some reason, I just knew you need to pray in tongues because that's, that's God's way of getting around your mind so that your mind can't shut your spirit down. You need to pray in tongues. You need to do it aggressively as often as you can. And sure enough, within a day and a half, the depression broke off of her. Uh, well, so I believed all that. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't for me. It wasn't happening. <laughs> but, you know, I just thought, you know, I was one of those people that just don't get it. <sighs> Make a long story short, I got it. <laughs> and I found out it wasn't something I didn't have the whole time. I just didn't have people who could help me. That's very frustrating. To, to, to come to that place and say, thank you, God. Now, why did I have to fight and slug so hard to get the, gospel, the whole gospel? That should have been given to me day one. Amen. And then my struggle isn't to get the truth my, or to get examples. My struggle is only just to walk in what I've received. If there's any struggle at all, and I, I believe once you've received the gospel, you move very quickly out of struggling and into life, because that's exactly what Jesus came. He came to give us life, not struggle. 
I, we, there is a struggle, but it's not against flesh and blood. And it's, he's given us overcoming life. What if we are more than conquerors because of him who lives in us. Well, I came into what I would call the in Christ message. What Curry, um, what Curry teaches is the, the message of the new man. And if you haven't gone through that, that's what I would recommend after going through this DHT. If you want to find out why, uh, why this works... This is what Jesus, would, when he was in the upper room with the disciples, and say, I have so many things that I want to teach you, but you never get it. So I've got to send the Spirit in to live inside of you. And on that day, in that day, when the Spirit comes, then you'll know that I am in my Father. And my Father is inside of me. And you are inside of me. In that day. How are we going to know it in that day? I mean, we could have known it right then. Like, I know it. You just said it. No, no, no. Not that way. It's not just because you said it. You're going to know it because you're going to be hooked up on the inside. Because you're going to experientially know you know, from the inside, from the spirit. From the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, you're going to see through the Spirit's eyes, feel through the Spirit's heart, and know my Lord is inside the Father. And the Father is inside my Lord. And guess how I know that? Because I'm inside my Lord. And I met the Father inside of Him. When I stepped inside of Christ in my spirit, it just said, Yes, I am in you. And I saw the Father in there. And He says, You're a son in my son. And I don't just know it. I know it. Why? I've been there, done that. Am there, am that. Okay? I'm sidetracked again. But I've, I've been walking in this for about 10 years. And then... The Lord tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know what, there's a room inside this house that you keep walking past the door. And some of it, I think, was out of the frustration. You know, when you lay hands on your, your wife over and over and over again uh, in the mission field, this is how I was praying. God, please heal my wife. But if you won't, please give us, you know, some help. That's how I was taught to pray. By the example. Not from the Word. Just the examples that I had around me. I couldn't, I couldn't expect it. I thought, I, was, I thought my hand was like a lightning rod. And I was trying to get lightning to come out of heaven and, and hit it. You know, and, because that's the way I looked at it. You know, healing is a miracle. And miracles just don't happen very regularly. So it's kind of like, please, 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 don't we really need this? And that's, so I just sort of had this room that was inside of Jesus Christ that I didn't realize that I could open that door. And I opened that door, and it was very simple. The Lord opened it for me because I remember hearing someone speak and say, you know what, when we lay hands on somebody, it is not hope so. It's not maybe so. It is because the gospel that we have is yes and amen. amen. Jesus Christ isn't hope so. He isn't maybe so. He isn't yes and no. He is yes and amen. Salvation is in Christ. Deliverance is in Christ. Healing is in Christ. And it's always yes and amen. Always. It's not not today, son. Or keep trying harder. It is not that. And the Lord just kind of opened my eyes to the fact that this is the way it is. And, and I just humbled myself and said, Lord, I'm not there. I'm not. When I put my hand on somebody, it's like, I really doubt it. <laughs> but it'd be great. And I had been taught by my experience, not by the Word. And because I was a pastor, and because I was a theologian, and had a lot of things that I 
did believe it was important for me to be right. But, and so I had a good deal of theology that I could explain my powerlessness. I really could. And I could teach that to people that would listen to me. And because I'm a decent teacher, people would believe it because it would be well-reasoned out. But Paul in Colossians said, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. And then he says a couple verses later, and don't let any man take you captive by traditions of men or human philosophies. I had a great thought process. It was just human. It really was. It wasn't according to Christ. I was walking in me, and I was walking in my ideas. But when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, if your theology doesn't match up with Jesus Christ, guess what? You need to dump your theology. I finally figured that out. I was driving home. I was uh, working a consulting job. And I said, Lord, I really think that I'm wrong on this. But I can't get my mind past this. So I just did what I knew to do. And I just said, Lord, get me past it. You're going to have to, you're going to have to get me past it. And I began to pray in tongues. And then immediately the word came to me. It's in the name. And that meant a lot to me because I, I, God had done a lot to teach me about what it means. What's in the name of Christ. In his name is him, basically. Everything that he is. And the Holy Spirit takes of him. And just closes it, imparts it to us, gives it to us. So if it's in the name, he said, until now you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be made complete. Right? So he's saying, right up till now you thought that all that I've been doing is just for me. And he said, no, I'm moving in. I bought you. You're my house. I'm coming to move inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit, and He has been with you. And it's been a great experience, hasn't it? Hearing God's voice when I speak. Seeing God work when I work. All that's going to change now, guys. It's going to change locations. It's going to move from being with you to inside of you. That, that's what Jesus set up. He said, I've got it going on inside of me. But I'm hooking you guys up to the, how do you call it, uh, kingdom wide web. Amen. Right now, you've been doing your best to run programs that were installed through your hard drive, little CDs that people put inside of your floppy disk. Your mom and dad said be good and your and your and your classmates said you're ugly and your and all these things that got installed from man and your experiences. And Jesus said, I've been downloading everything that I'm running. I'm live streaming from heaven. That's all I am. I'm a live stream from heaven. And I'm hooking you guys up. I'm putting, I'm putting the connection inside of you now. You just poof, you just that's what I'm doing. That's what Pentecost is. And guess what? When we when we shut when we stop running our programs and just say, I'm a monitor. <laughs> I'm a monitor for a live stream from heaven. That's what that's what that's what the Christian life is. It is it is displaying the heart and the mind and the power of the of the Lord Jesus Christ through our lives. That's exciting. Well, it's in the name. What do we see in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Was there ever anyone that was brought to him that he said, you know, I'd love to heal you, but I can tell my father's disciplining you for some sins you've been doing. <laughs> and, you know, until you repent, I just can't get you healed. Did Jesus, was someone ever brought to him and he said, you know what, I'm just not feeling the anointing today. You're going to have to come back later. Was there anyone that Jesus was brought was brought to Jesus that he said, you know, I can tell God is teaching you a lot through your sickness, and I'm just not going to uh, be able to teach you what you need with if I remove that sickness from your life. All the stuff that I have been teaching people for for way too long. And I had to just go back to my small group of people that I was meeting with. And I stopped on a dime. And I just said, I need to repent before you and just tell you that there's been some of you here that have been dealing with pain and chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and depression and various things in your life. And I've been encouraging you about how your spirit is one with God. And you have life with Him. And that's right. But I've been offering you less than the Gospel. Because that really just begins to sound like empty sympathy after a while. And sympathy is what you give people when all you've got is love with no power. But when you have love, there's a part of you that if you really could, you'd get it off of them. Yeah. You really would. It's not just, hey, I feel bad for you. It's, I feel bad for you. And gospel is this. Jesus didn't walk around saying, you know what? I'm just, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a sympathetic, nice guy. Saying, you poor blind guy. Man, just, just be encouraged because I'm getting you, I'm getting you into heaven, man. It's going to be all better when you get there. That's the gospel that the church, for the most part, is being raised up in. And, and so no wonder we're living at the level that we're living. Because we're, we're, the, we're, we're living at that level because we're being taught at that level. And that's why the healing ministry teaching that Dave was, was getting into that was bringing him down in results... Boy, you know, 80% results would be a huge step forward for a lot of people, wouldn't it? 60% results. 20%. Just give me something, you know? One miracle. You know, I got an result. <laughs> that would be a huge step forward. That'd be like revival for a lot of for a lot of congregations. We got one miracle today. You know? But most of and as soon as they get that one miracle, you know what they do? They start a healing ministry and they start writing books and they start teaching people the theology that gets them one miracle a week at their congregation. And it starts bringing everybody down. That's why it's really important to me. I don't know how God did it. I was clicking around on the internet after this came true, you know, that, that the revelation came from the Spirit. And uh, I was just finally at the right place that I could, clicked on something that was John G. Lake. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. He got lots of healings. There's probably something pretty good there. I thought I thought he was dead. So I clicked on it. Curry Blake's on there. I, I thought he was John G. Lake for a while. <laughs> and, and Curry is teaching. I'm like, yeah, this guy gets it. Yeah, this guy gets it. And it was kind of neat to find, and he, get, he actually got a lot more detail than I had ever, because he was dealing with objections I had never come across. Oh, I never thought about screwing people up that way. <laughs> I just had my way of messing people's theology up. I was, I, was, uh, I was shocked to know that there were people more screwed up than me than <laughs> out there. But it was really nice, because uh, the, the results, the testimonies, and the teaching, it all has to match up. And that's what I want. I, I don't want smoozy things that feel good, uh, that don't get results. I want something that's Jesus in blue jeans in the workplace 
at the Walmart, in the parking lot, in the hospital, not in the congregation where you got people in fancy white sh suits uh, taking up huge offerings to uh, keep jet fuel in their planes and air conditioning their dogs and stuff like that. I want, because deep down in my heart, I'm a missionary. Because there's people that are dying without Christ out there. And words alone won't get it. But Jesus never came with words alone. And he never sent anyone out preaching the gospel. That he didn't give the authority and the power and the command to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. He never sent someone out with a track. That, that he made them a track. He said, preach the kingdom and demonstrate it. Because the power of God isn't for showing off. The power of God is for setting the captives free. It's for healing the sick. It's for dealing with the stuff that everybody deals with. And he never did a background check to find out what did you do. He never turned anyone away. And so when I looked at what's inside the name, what's inside that man, and that that man dwells inside of me, I just realized, you know what? There was stuff that he didn't put inside of me that were, that were the problem. It was those things that came in installed uh, from the floppy disks of religion or my own experience. And, uh, and even, even now I'm finding, you know, the thing that, that once people get this message that you're going to have to learn, you just don't go there, is, okay, I, didn't, I believe all this, but I didn't get an immediate result. Why not? Wrong question. Now you're analyzing again. And if you're not careful, you're going to keep analyzing and analyzing and analyzing, and eventually your mind or a demon is going to supply an answer, and you're going to start believing that answer instead of the Bible. Yeah. Stay in faith and just keep going after it, and, and, and eventually you are going to see the results that the Word of God uh, uh, describes. Well, I was going to have Andy share a testimony about the guy we talked about that was quadriplegic. Now, it would have been real easy when you've seen this guy to say, oh my God, I can't do this. And I come to a conclusion a long time ago, there's nothing that me and Jesus can't be. And just share a little bit with what you've seen there, what, what I did right away. Yeah, it was good. When... You know, we overcome the enemy by the Word of God and our testimony and loving not our lives even unto death. All three of those got to be together. We tend to leave the last one off. Okay? Um, but, so, I'm established in this. I've got the Word. But you still have emotional reactions that come not from the Word, but from walking into a new circumstance. We all do that. We have to fight the fight of faith. And the things that are seen sometimes war to get our attention and to become our belief, a uh, source of our belief, rather than uh, the things that are unseen and eternal. Well, you know, I'm excited. We're gonna. We just came from a meeting where it was like a hot knife through butter. Everybody that came forward it was like, boom. You know, what do you what do you need? Boom. Okay, check it. Yeah, it's gone. You know, like, oh great, man. It was just like boom, 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 boom. Just everybody's getting healed. So we're all pumped up. We walk into this situation. You see all these hospital apparatuses. You hear the breathing machine, and you see this this person just completely, you know, unable to move. And you know that they've been there for a long time. And there's a part of my heart that is uh, that's pastoral, but it's natural. There's a part of me that 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 needs to, you know, that worries about people's emotions and stuff like that. Oh gosh, you know, what if we get this guy's hopes up? You know, that thought came to me. I knew it was from the devil, and I knew it was from my flesh. Uh, and immediately, I was like, no, nope, in Jesus' name, this is going down. Well, while, while I'm doing that, one of the things that really helped was Dave. Uh, he's in there. He said, no, nope, my back's been broke. Twice, my neck's been broke. I've been dead uh, several times. I've been run over by a truck. This is nothing. And I was like, yeah! <laughs> you know, it's nice. The body of Christ ought to be a 
source of strength and encouragement for one another. We ought to we ought to be able to do that. David had Jonathan. There's times where David didn't have Jonathan and strengthened himself. But meanwhile, the spiritual leaders in our midst, we ought to be building one another up in faith, not tearing one another down. Right? We ought to be able to speak faith into one another. And so, listen, I don't have my testimony, but now I walk into quadriplegics or wherever. I say, you know what? I know a guy. He's been dead four times. He's been smashed by a truck, back broke, neck broke. Now I've been laying hands on this, this guy. He didn't feel anything from his neck down for a year, for two and a half years. Now he's getting tingling in his feet. He's got back pain. His, his muscles are moving. God's wired up the house. And one of these days, very soon, he's going to flip the switch. And he's just going to pop up and he's going to be done. And we are already proclaiming that he's that many are going to see and hear and put their trust in the Lord. He's got a call on his life and he's excited about getting up and going around the world. My daughter, my daughter said to him, and I told him this, I said, my daughter said, you know what, when he gets up out of that chair, he's not going to sit still a moment. <laughs> and he's not. You know, I didn't have a lot of theology, but I know how many times Jesus saved me. And if he's no respecter, he'll do it for you too. And I know my life's been very, very unusual, and I don't share a lot of the really, really wild things. But I've, I've, I've been fine-tuned it where I can help you. And it's, it's uncanny how many times you walk into a situation. I, yep, I've already been there. I thought it was that, I don't believe God did it. I believe the devil did it. But I overcame everything. I, I, I've lived almost everybody's worst nightmare. And look at I'm homo. And I'm, I got the funnest job in the world now. I get to set captives free. Yeah. But what's really fun is telling it you can do everything that I can do. Yes. And my goal is for you to get more testimonies than me. Yeah. To get the little kids doing it. We took an atheist last year, a year and a half ago. He didn't want no part of this. And he just had got born again and filled the Holy Ghost before I ran into him. I knew his grandma and grandpa. And I was going to pray for a lady that had a bad knee, and I stopped. I, you got this. He looked at me like, no, no, you're crazy. Put your hand on there and walk you through it. He no more said in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and I don't even know what word we use, that life or power. And this lady shook. She had... She got a new hip and a new knee. The next 100 people that guy prayed for, I was jealous because he prayed for a guy who's deathbed, and within 10 minutes, the guy was up doing calisthenics. <coughs> His wife took off in tongues, and I looked and I said, has she ever done that before? <laughs> and the other lady that brought us there said, no, she's a Presbyterian. She, doesn't, she gets mad when I do it. <laughs> We were in their house 10 minutes from saying hi, and the guy with no hope, he had a spinal cancer, was doing calisthenics because he had faith in the name of Jesus. He had no theology, but he had faith in the name of Jesus. I was jealous because he was getting better results than I was. I, I, he followed me around. He said, I want what you got. Sure, you know, I, I want help. So I'd have him... Uh, Somebody come up to me with a tumor in their ear. Will you pray for me later? I said, nope, right now. Chad, touch your ear. Boom. It's gone. Our theology is our hindrance. That's why we got to get this right. It's, it's better that you know a couple things really well than it is a whole bunch of things you kind of not really know about. This is the best teaching on earth. And you think, well, what's this do about healing? This whole thing is about the kingdom. Healing is an act of warfare. Yes. When I healed this, remember when he sent out the 70? What's the first thing Jesus said when they come back? I saw Satan fall like lightning. And we got some of these other ministries doing this, some of this really weird stuff. You want to get, you take back your city, you get everybody healed. You get them healed, delivered, born again, and filled with the Holy Ghost. They'll come flocking in. 
the, the, the people that aren't right will either get born again and they'll go find some other, because there'll be too many radical believers running around. If they won't even be what, you know, I go to the hard places, the halfway houses, the jails. The funnest ministry I ever went to was we got a booth at a holistic conference. There was a hundred and some, everything that wasn't Jesus. <laughs> I just walk up to them and I'll demonstrate it. Just, can I pray for you right now in the name of Jesus? Boom! <laughs> they got healed while they were deciding to tell me no. The power got healed and they got healed and all the psychics couldn't get a reading. We can't get a reading. We can't. Jesus just healed this one. You'd like to give your heart to Jesus? The goodness of God draws him. We had the psychics and whatever else they were called. They had a whole bunch of names that I know. They were falling out. The, the head of the mob Rishi thing down there in Fairfield, one of the leaders, I come up to him and, can I pray for you? No. And he starts shaking. <laughs> Why are you shaking? He said, the Holy Spirit is all over me. <laughs> Paul said, I don't preach with elegant words, but with a demonstration of power. Now, most of the time, I don't feel nothing. I, 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 if you watch me and people have been around me, did anybody see me fasting and praying? These guys are the car no. <laughs> My wife thinks I should more. Here's a demonstration of power right there. <laughs> you know, and I, I broke all the tradition. I have never fasted in my life. I know that goes against everybody. Oh, you got to fast to do this. I said, well, you know, when you get more results than I do, I'll listen. Curry's got the best results of anybody I know. If you look at the track record, this message, all it is is the Word of God rightly divided and it works. It's, it's the coolest thing. My, my grandmother told me I'd be doing this when I was four years old. It took me 40-some years to get a hold of it. And it, the whole life was training for it. And I didn't even realize it. Because I didn't, I kept me out of all the Bible colleges that were teaching traditions and not just Bible. If you realize that this is wrote in heaven, it's not going to change. Whether you believe it or not, it does not make a hill of beans whether it's true or not. Amen. And the more of them truths you get that you're unshakable on, yeah. Try to convince me that healing ain't around like you're looking at a dead blind cripple. You know, you're not going to convince me. <laughs> you're not going to convince me because of all the miracles I get to see. All the lives I, and the people I get trained up like Andy's family and they have family from Illinois. I call them the Holy Ghost kids. <laughs> they get more results than most adults. One of, the, one of the neatest ones was we did a DHT about a year ago in Morris, Illinois, and it was a home. I don't know, there was about 20 people, and on day two, this lady who had never walked upstairs, she was, we found out later she was 70 years old. She had to walk upstairs like this. And I said, you know, you're in pain. You'll, you'll listen a lot better. We get that pain off of you. So I went to start to just grab her hand, and the little six-year-old says, can I pray? Well, sure. I was amazed. I had to catch the lady from going to the screen. <laughs> so her eight-year-old sister got jealous. Can I do it too? Well, yeah. So I had to catch the lady a second time. And then I said, do you have any pain? She said, no. So we went around the corner, and she was running up and down the stairs. That was day two of just sitting and listening to the DHT. We weren't talking and telling them how to heal. We were just telling them who they were. And just a month before, they found out we were having meetings there because we were going over to Illinois once a month. And my wife's got a passion for kids. She ran a daycare. and She got them all these little kids just filled the Holy Ghost the month before. In one month's time, the six-year-old, the eight-year-old. How old were the other two? Like 12 and 14. 12 and 14 were getting more results out doing the gospel work than most ministers I know. And now we got a second family 
And if you see some of these videos, we got the two Holy Ghost families together. Kids are about the same age. They were all partnered up, and us adults just stood back and let the kin kids demonstrate the love of God. Amen. It, it was just, we about, it's about ready just to start bawling. You know how precious that is? You'll never convince them kids that this ain't real, that God doesn't love people. The two little girls prayed for a lady without her thumb, and her thumb grew back with a nail. And the little, I gave them one of our cameras, or maybe it was your camera, was, and they took, they got a short clip of it with a lady testified. So we thought we missed it. And they found, looking back on the chips, they, you know, the kids didn't do a real good job probably, but they got it. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know a lot of adults like me that don't get it too. It's, yeah, it's, it's a close-up of a thumb. And, and you see this lady, half of her face in the background. <laughs> you know, the neat thing, as Dave was saying, it, what you're going to find is you start walking in this, and the people that you thought were against, that weren't interested in God, they really just weren't interested in religion. Uh, nobody likes sickness. Nobody likes cancer. Nobody likes the fact that life feels really hard and feels like we're doing it all on our own. And that's what Jesus was, what's made, what made him different. He's, no, the kingdom of God is right at your hand's reach. He, he, the kingdom of God came here to touch you. You are not on your own. God cares about you. He cares about your hurts. He cares about your pains. He cares about your life. And when you begin to show up in people's lives as a messenger, as a carrier of this kingdom and this God, instead of, hey, you know, don't you know you're a sinner and you need to just start being good? <laughs> You know, there's a place there's a place for talking about where people are. But let's show up with good news. Amen. Let's show up with Jesus Christ, who loved you so much he died for you. He's Lord of all, and that's why he came to touch you today. Now, wouldn't you want the Lord who touched your body and set you free from a disease or a sickness or a pain or affliction in your body? Wouldn't you like him to be the Lord of your heart and your soul and the rest of your life? Because you got a lot going on in here too. And he can take care of all that. So we're going to take another short break. We'll be back in 10 minutes.